डॉक्टर शिव कुमार सर बैलेंसिंग एक्ट इन एन एस एशिया हाउ इट कैन बी अचीव्ड गारा गामा रामा एंड ग्रामा बाय डॉक्टर शिव कुमार एंड ड्रामा एज वेल गुड मॉर्निंग एवरीवन नाइस टू सी एवरीवन हियर अप अर्ली वन थिंग आई रिक्वेस्ट ऑल दी डेलीगेट्स इज टू can you please put your uh, mobile phones on uh, silent mode i like uh, special effects <laughs> but it can be distracting to others so just put it on uh, silent mode please and this topic we have actually discussed uh, so many times on the on the group facebook group and i would like to also tell you that i was telling you yesterday that this uh, cme is different Uh, from any other cme and if you actually now open your uh, facebook go to the anesthetics you will see why you can have a look it's fine i didn't tell you to not look at your facebooks <laughs> okay so all the lectures all the lectures i don't need a sound it's fine yeah. all the lectures uh, the topics will be actually uploaded Uh, guru is doing that along with dr vivek gupta you will not get time to actually ask all the questions A any conference the time is limited but you can actually continue asking it so the cme continues even after the uh, conference finishes so greeting from liverpool uh, liverpool is known as the city of beatles okay beatles uh, people it's a, it's a band group it's a very famous band group from 60s okay why why this okay you have you have kids who cross rivers every day in part of india where there no you know uh, resources no bridges okay so they some of them battle through this and uh, some of them are swim through it i i actually was reading some time back there was a teacher who is directly cross the river every day i mean i've so many people might have read it on the uh, uh, you know facebook or other places okay you might actually like to row across the river but this is what we're talking about building bridges making things simple and i hope you got my point so coming back to the topic itself it sounds very it's a it's a gara we call it gara no gara actually in our language actually means man but no it gara i think it's like it should have had a edge you know it's more musical it's not about mud okay uh, rama gama <laughs> drama <laughs> grama okay all of them actually have something very common to them okay it's more multimodal analogies here i keep harping about multimodal analogies here all the time okay. why is why is it so 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 important If you give GA, okay, multimodal analgesia yeah, is is actually okay. It makes sense. Okay, you need to actually use uh, other agents to actually improve the analgesia. Yeah. So, so why with others? And I'll come back to that. So, all of us know about opiates. It's got so many uh, side effects. I mean, you can keep listing them. You can make a a much bigger list. Okay, and all of us know that we don't like it. Patients don't like it. We don't like it. So there is a term called Ofa, and I was actually at the European Society of Anesthetists meeting this uh, in somewhere in June. Guru was there as well. <laughs> I did attend that that meeting, but Guru actually had to go away because he forgot his delegate card, and they wouldn't allow him in, so he had to go back. So opiate free anesthesia, we've been discussing. I think we had a, such an animated discussion. Myself and and Guru was there. We had such an animated discussion on this on the Facebook group. He said, "Why? Why? What's wrong with the uh, opiates? Everybody uses them." And then now this term is suddenly coming up. We have been doing it for last twelve years. I hardly use opiates, and uh, there are many reasons now. Actually, people actually say that we want to discharge patient early. because if you have a patient who develop nausea and vomiting you can be sure the patient will stay overnight if you stay overnight okay the cost of stay increases 
They want patients to go home early. Everybody wants to go home early. You don't want any respiratory depression effects. You don't want any nausea vomiting. You don't want... Okay, there are multiple reasons why people actually don't want to use opiates. And then comes this thing which we discussed about, and it says in cancer patients. It's been shown that opiates are not good for cancer patients. They increase the incidence of recurrence. And on the other hand, if you use regional technique, you can actually reduce uh, the recurrence. So, okay, understood with GA, you have to use multimodal analgesia, but why multimodal analgesia? People say, oh, why should we be using? I gave a wonderful spinal anesthesia, patient was pain free. What's the need for a multimodal analgesia? Why should I be actually giving this patient other things? Or even if you use, like we call GARA, okay, GA regional, and multimodal analgesia, you're giving a block to this patient. Why, why uh, do I need to use multimodal analgesia? Okay. And I would like you to read this statement. Okay. Everybody thinks acute pain is actually transient. It stops the moment the patient actually has a surgery done and you, you know, recover from that stops. It doesn't. Okay. How many uh, people from chronic pain who do chronic pain knew about this? Okay. All the changes which are actually happening in so-called chronic pain, you read a chronic pain, they call that, when the chronic pain occurs in a region, there is actually a, a soup of all mediators. All the mediators which you read in, about in chronic pain are actually initiated at the time of acute injury. And these mediators, they sensitize or directly activate nociceptors. Yet, but nature has special effects, by. <laughs> Okay, cascade of events are initiated. So, for example, you have bradykinin and prostaglandins. They sensitize or activate noc uh, nociceptors. There is substance P. There is a CGRP or concentrated uh, gene-related peptide. Okay. Now, what do these substance P do does? Substance P degenerates mast cells. Okay, it's releases histamine, and all of us know histamine not only activates the receptors, it causes edema. The inflammation is set in now. Okay, the edema which is seen around the site of the surgery or surgical site, actually it's, it's because of these uh, mediators. The substance P not only causes edema, it again uh, causes additional release of bradykinin. Okay. More edema occurs. Okay. CGRP, okay, dilated blood vessels, again more edema. Okay, and our activation of septa occurs. The platelets are activated because you know there is going to be bleeding. Okay, we all know platelets are important for coagulation. Okay, these platelets also release uh, serotonin, okay, which also activate nociceptors. Okay, there are so many substances been released. So there's inflammation. There are a lot of things happening in there. Okay, and if this is actually continued, you can stop it. Okay, may not really not stop it, but you can reduce it. But if this Sensitization occurs further. This is what leads to something called the persistent post-operative pain, surgical pain, or PPSP. <clears throat> and it's so common, okay, but a lot of us don't know because we don't follow up the patient. We are happy the moment the patient is actually in the recovery, patient is happy, the nurse says, oh, you're a wonderful anesthetist, doc. <laughs> I love you <laughs> because your patient they didn't have to do anything. They didn't have to actually worry about them crying. You didn't have to give them more morphine. Like they were ready to discharge from. They love you. Okay, but what happens after that? Okay, a lot of us don't know. But the people actually who do chronic pain, those are the ones who actually face these patients. They see them coming there. They come with pain which actually nags them, which keeps them awake all night. It, it disturbs their life. Okay. Tissue trauma is not about just physical trauma. It also involves cognitive emotional discomfort. It disturbs their life. Okay. I have got eclipse tendonitis. Okay, it flares up now and then. And I tell you, it disturbs me. Okay, it, it actually it doesn't allow me to sleep at times. Not just because of pain. It's nagging. Even if it's not severe pain, it just... 
you know, nagging pain, it, it actually keeps you disturbed, okay? It affects you, okay? I can't do anything which I feel normal. And I imagine someone who is actually living with chronic pain, okay? So here is, you know, us who can actually now influence that. Okay, it's not very simple. This uh, post-surgical person, person in post-surgical pain, PPSP is not that simple, okay? There are a lot of other factors involved. So if you look at nociceptor uh, stimulation or the nerve injury, Okay, neuroplasticity which occurs at the spinal cord level, it's happening. Okay, when you actually tissue is uh, uh, trauma is initiated, it has started. Okay. And it can lead to chronic pain, but there are other things. It's the experience of the patient is important. Okay, genetic make makeup. We don't know exactly. There are genes being discovered which might say that, okay, these are the ones which might initiate that. Okay, we know that young patients... It's more common if you actually sustain injury at a younger age. It is that uh, older patients don't develop PPSP that much. Okay, memory of the pain is important. Okay, if you are very anxious, okay, you have a patient who go go for a surgery is very anxious. Okay, I'm, prob I'm stressing on the anxiety. Anxiety is a very important factor. So if you are young, you're a female, you're anxious. Three factors are enough for you to actually develop PPSP. Just three factors. And no doubt that breast surgery okay, is associated with very high incidence of PPSP. So if you look at anesthesia adjuncts, okay, these things we can influence. We may not be able to influence the genetics. We are genetically fools, we will remain a fool. <laughs> we can't change it. Or maybe in the future, there might be gene slicing and a replacement, okay, but presently we can't, okay. So, people have looked at it for a long time, even as back as 1999, okay, there was a review article uh, by the Carr and Goss, and they said that unrelieved post-operative pain, it leads to clinical and psychological changes, and because of these, we can have increased morbidity and mortality, which I talked about, there is increased cost because the patient is staying over. It's just not about just having the operation and developing complaint. Patient can actually overstay. So if the patient could, if you do everything beautifully, you could discharge them the same day. If they stay for a day or two, the cost of uh, your stay increases and obviously affects the quality of life. So how big is acute pain a problem? How big is this problem? Okay. So let's look at the post-operative. Okay. It is said almost three out of four patients will have moderate to severe pain even after they leave the hospital. Okay. So almost 80% of patients likely are crying in pain. 80%. Okay, that's a long back. So let's move forward. So what happens in 2003? Okay, we have come to the modern age. 21st century, did we change? What do you think? Did it change? Did our understanding increase or improve? Good, no. Puja is saying no. <laughs> you're right, Puja, you're absolutely right. Okay, then it was still 80%. Okay, so, oh, so people said, oh, we moved to 21st century, we have to do something about this. Our understanding has improved, we have to do something about it. Okay. So then again, Gan TJ, okay, he's actually produced quite a lot of papers on PNV as well. If you look at Gan, okay, he's produced a lot of papers on that. He's a very good researcher. Okay. So he actually did a study again. I says, okay, let's see. Have we gone fed? Now it's down around almost 10 years down the line. Okay. So let's see what, what happens. Okay. Oh, is the patient still crying in pain? Okay, we made some improvement. Okay, it has come down to 75%. 75% of patients can still be at home after the surgery uh, with moderate to severe pain. That's not good. That's not good. Okay. So, as I've said, acute pain impacts patient lives. Okay. It can increase hospital stay. It can increase admissions, uh, readmissions. A few years back, we did a a audit on the shoulder surgeries. Okay, everybody was so delighted because we had introduced ultrasound guided uh, nerve blocks in somewhere in 2006. Everybody was learning ultrasound block. Okay, it was the new kid on block. 
People were doing uh, nerve stimulation techniques for that. Patients were absolutely pain-free in the, in the recovery. They were discharged home without any pain. Well, we said, All right, let's follow it up. Let's see what happens to them. And you won't believe we were right. Actually, it was nearly 75% of patients were actually still in pain. We had a pain diary sent. Okay, we followed up them. And there were actually readmissions as well that surprised us. Now, this information we would have never got if we weren't actually following them up. So, as anesthetists, we actually don't get the, all the feedback. The surgeons may not tell you what's happening with your patient. The patient might go to another hospital and say, yeah, I went for the operation there, I still have pain, I'm not going to go to the hospital. Okay, so that information is lost. It goes to some other place and somebody will actually do another block, they will go back home, maybe okay or not. Okay, all right. So inadequate acute pain management is a problem. Okay. And almost 50% of the patient, if you look at the overall population, almost 50% of the population can develop chronic pain. It's good business for chronic pain guys. <laughs> It is good business, but not everyone, not everyone actually comes back to uh, the play, pain clinic. Not everyone will actually, actually, you know, think that, oh, yeah, I had an operation, you know, doctor said, uh, yesterday we were talking that they like patients to be in pain. Who was we with yesterday in a, in a, we were in a group and it was saying that because, uh, oh, Dennis Pierce, <laughs> where is he? Oh, there he is. <laughs> he's started giving blocks and uh, he says the surgeons are so unhappy because his patients are pain free. They want patients to scream so that they can say, look, I've done an operation. <laughs> because if you actually have a patient who is pain free post-op, patient wakes up and say, Dr. Sub, operation ho gaya kya? <laughs> okay. So they might think, Are, yeah, the surgeon ne operation kar diya, hume to dard bhi nuha, and why is he charging us the fees? <laughs> okay. So they are afraid they might actually lose their business. Okay, but that's not true. Okay. Now, if this is actually a very complex uh, thing, like injury. Okay, we take it at a very simplistically. But if you look over the minutes and days, I mean, this talk about in microseconds. I mean, look at the number of mediators which have been released or the changes which are happening. Okay, it's huge. Okay. So coming back to multimodal analgesia itself, okay. Now ASA in 2012 actually released a guideline. They defined multimodal therapy as administration of two or more pharmacolog uh, pharmacological agents or technical approaches. Okay. And this was in 2012. Well, we've been doing it before, is this, isn't it? So obviously they have realized that we're not actually taking care of pain very well. So we all know the rationale for multimodal therapy. Okay, we target different pain pathways. We use multiple agents so that we can use their synergistic effects. And we use them so that we can reduce the dose of, especially of opiates and individual drugs as well. Now you don't want to just be giving someone just non-steroidals, okay, day in, day out, and then they develop a ulcer, then bleed, and they come to the hospital with bleed. You don't want to do that. And obviously to reduce the adverse effects of these agents. So again, they have given some key practice guidelines, okay, which are very, very important. And this is very important. Okay. So they are saying we need to use them. Okay, the societies are recognizing that that multimodal analgesia is very, very, very important. Okay, they give you the choices of what all you can use, and you can actually look at it, and they are actually talking about things we, we talk about on the group. I mean, I tell everyone, it's not difficult at all. There isn't any rocket science in actually doing multimodal analgesia, and it doesn't cost money at all. I mean, how costly is a it, a, in a bottle of paracetamol, okay, say a 400 rupees, okay, that is nothing for something you would spend if the patient develop PPSP or chronic pain. The surgeon may be cribbing about it, but it's not. And you want to be still cheap, you can actually initiate it before. You can actually give two tablets paracetamol before the surgery. 
You can start on them on non-steroids, ibuprofen or whatever. Okay, if you're worried about the gastric effects, you can give it with a PPI. Okay. Dexamethasone, how much does it cost? 4 milligrams, 8 milligrams, how much does it cost? Okay. So even if you use two or three agents like a paracetamol and uh, non-steroidal and maybe dexamethasone, three drugs are more than enough for you to actually do something. You may not be able to do everything, but you actually start initiating the multimodal analgies here. Okay. Okay, so opiates are still, I mean, we cannot get rid of them. It's not easy to get rid of them. We still need them. But unfortunately, morphine is not the drug. I know it's a commonly used analgesic. It is the worst of all. There is a lot of research coming out into this. Okay, it may not affect the normal patients, but patients with cancer surgeries, okay, morphine is not, not the drug. Fentanyl they found is fine. It's not as bad. So yes, we can use fentanyl for these patients. But like you talked about other things, that's fine. Combining local anesthetic techniques, we talk about it day in, day out. Okay, and there are a whole list of things which you can talk of. People have been using ketamine, low doses ketamine infusion. People have been giving pregabalin, especially like knee surgeries and all. Pregabalin is very, very commonly used. Gulpentanoids, okay. People have used ivilinocaine. It worked for certain surgeries, for not all, all of them. Okay, and alpha-2 agonist, okay. As simple as clonidine, which is cheap. Okay, obviously in, in, in India, uh, Dexmed is actually cheaper than uh, in U, uh, UK or in US. We can use clonidine, which is a cheaper alternative. Okay, you guys can use Dexmed. All of us know about these pain pathways, okay. You know the physiology of pain pathways, where all we can actually do it. So we are looking at actually initiating this uh, multimodal analgesia, which affects at every stage. Okay, so if you look at this, okay. so we can use at the local, at the site of injury itself. We can look at uh, the pain pathways, the nerves which goes to the spinal cord, at the spinal cord level, and at the brain level, okay. So even if you don't actually have to use this, okay, you don't actually even have to look at it, you just give these drugs, some of them, and they work at all places, okay. So uh, let me look at it a simple uh, surgery, like a hernia surgery. Okay, it's just not us. Everybody is involved, even surgeons have to actually think of it. So we've seen this. Okay, we know where we can act. Now like, let's look at it, how other people actually are affected. So if you look at hernia surgery itself, ligation of hernia sac, how the surgeon does that. He finds a nerve, does he actually, you know, tease it out from the tissues, or he just say, I don't care, this is going to cause me a problem, I'm going to cut it. I know one of my friends who does it, who does on his edges, does, he says, kuch nahi hota yaar, I'll just, he just cuts to the nerve. Because the patient is not going to come back, okay. Does the nerve get entrapped the way they directly do the surgery? Okay, they put a mesh or things, do they get entrapped? How do they fix the, actually the mesh itself? How are they fixing it, okay? Are they fixing it to the bone on the medial side? Are they using tacks? Are they using absorbable sutures? Okay, are they doing a laparoscopic surgery? Is laparoscopic surgery better than a open surgery? Okay, let me ask, how many think the laparoscopic surgery actually reduces post, uh, PPSP? Yeah, in hernia. Okay, the surgeons actually, yeah. The surgeons thought that, if, okay, we've been talking about the way the dissection is done and, and the way the fixing is done, so we'll just go and put a mesh from inside. Okay, uh, it is a, in thing, okay, we can show the patient thing on the, on the TV, you said, oh, we did through a little hole surgery. Okay, no, it didn't, okay. Then obviously there are other things, okay, experience of the patient, okay. Did you make the experience good? Okay, did you have a patient who was pain-free? Did you look into these anxiety levels? Did you actually talk to the patient when you uh, went for a PAC? Okay, did you talk, did you explain, did the surgeon explain what they're gonna do? Okay, those things do affect it. Okay. Complication, did the patient develop a hematoma later on? Okay. So all these factors do actually affect how the injury will continue. Okay. And pain management is, is a teamwork. 
it's not just me, you, the surgeons. Okay, there are other patient uh, things also involved. Okay, the physiotherapists involved. Psychotherapists can be also be involved. Okay, and that's the only way you can actually prevent pain. But we can do our job. Okay, if we do our job properly, we can say, okay, I did make a difference. And that's why, okay, GA or regional anesthesia or GA with regional anesthesia, no blocks is just one part of it. You have to initiate multimodal analgesia. How many of you, actually, when you give spinal, give them a gram of paracetamol, some dexamethasone, or a diclofenac, ibuprofen? How many are doing? How many of you are doing it? So we have made a difference then, isn't it? You have learned it obviously on the net. Okay. It is simple. It's easy to forget. It's easy to forget. You said spinal anesthesia. We actually have given it such a nice block. The patient can't even move the limb. Okay. But initiate it. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for the lecture. Okay. And so any questions? Yes, Navin. Yeah, go on. <laughs> I'll ask Abhijit well, to answer it. <laughs> clearly, <clears throat> for a given surgical procedure, when we extrapolate this to millions of patients who would eventually undergo surgery or yeah. any procedure, yeah. the amount of drugs or intervention we're going to be offering in the name of multimodal analgesia is going to be quite high. So would you think that is the likelihood of... Uh, interventions or medication induced problems because yeah. everything you do has an inherent risk to it. Absolutely. So now not everyone gets <coughs> this chronic pain issue. Yeah. Now for the benefit of a fair few select patients, we are kind of enforcing a very elaborate uh, approach yeah. on an yeah. entire population. Yeah. So is there a chance of you trying to presumption of guilt no, I think, I think of innocence? I think you got one thing wrong. Okay, the chronic pain, like I said, is actually huge. Uh, does anybody know what is the incidence of PPSP or chronic pain in knee surgeries? Chronic pain, guys, do you do you know? Fifty to sixty percent. That is not a small number. It's not. No, 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 you're not talking five to ten percent. Okay. Do you know what is the incidence of uh, the PPSP in hernia surgery? Recorded anywhere from 25 to 75 percent. It's a simple surgery. Patient come for day case. Okay, you can do it under spinal anesthesia. Okay, you're not looking at actually too many. Like I said, it has, doesn't have to be all the interventions. You don't have to load them with pregabalin. Okay, where patient goes drowsy. Okay, but if you actually put them on just simple things like you know, uh, paracetamol and and ibuprofen, non-steroidal. Give them a shot of dexamethasone during the surgery, which doesn't do any harm at all. Okay. It does cause harm in ward with very small single dose. It's the harm is almost 0.0001%. Okay, it's very very small. Okay, but you might be actually making a little difference to that. It's very difficult to actually quantitate. I mean, how how do we know what is the numerator for the nerve blocks is? Okay, and that's where database comes from. We do not know the problem. So many surgeries, millions of surgeries are done. Do we know what happens to the patient later on? We do not know. Not everybody is followed up for specifically for are they doing well? Patients say, yes, I had hernia. It has got a little better, but I still feel pain. I know patient personally who said, I don't feel normal in that area. Okay, but they learn to live with it. That's the thing. Now, uh, the question about joint replacement yeah. is that most of those pain is... The reason for most people undergoing joint replacement itself is that they've got chronic pain. Yeah. And because I have a kind of a biased view on that because I see all these patients come to the intensive care start of area. So they're already on like 60 milligrams BD of oxytocin <laughs> and all these yeah. things, you know. Yeah. They're stuffed for the last 10 years. Yeah. I don't think the surgery is realistically going to fix. Yeah. Make the surgeons happier or more prosperous, I would say. But yeah. whether it really changes the outcome, we don't know. Because yeah. six months later, they come with another problem. Yeah. If you were already on 60 of oxycontin, it still remains like 40 or 60. I, can, I cannot recall many patients yeah. actually going off their chronic pain, yeah. irrespective of attempted surgical fixation on radiological right. satisfaction. Yeah. So the 60%, if you, is there a way of pre-test prediction telling that this patient would benefit from a yes, multiple there is. analgesia? There is. Okay, I didn't talk about it. There is a scoring system for it. And I mentioned it briefly. 
Okay. Women, young age, anxiety. Okay. Pain, pain which is already present, okay, itself is. And like you said, that's what knee surgery is. But the knee surgery actually is something else. Okay, it improves their mobility. It can improve their quality of life. They can actually move from one place to other. They can actually enjoy things which they couldn't before. Okay, that changes. So they learn to live with the pain. And it's, it's actually amazing. This patient's actually present not at, you know, three months or six months. Some of them actually present after, after two or three years. Then they realize, I've actually had a knee surgery. They've started enjoying life. Okay, that actually takes a back. The pain takes a back seat. Okay, later on they said, I've had a surgery. I've actually doing everything which I've now wanted to do. Okay, now I still have a pain. This is chronic pain, isn't it? It can't because that's you're very right. It doesn't, but the incidence is very high. Thank you, Shiv. Yeah. Um, for everyone's benefit, each of the talk uh, will come up on Facebook, uh, and soon after the talk is done, feel free to pu put your queries there. It may not be answered today, but anytime, whenever anyone is free, we can comment and we can discuss with each other. Yeah. This is again something unique that we are doing with the help of Facebook, of, co uh, of course, you know. So there is no limit for you to ask any kind of question. So if you are hesitant to ask here, ask it on Facebook. Yeah. You can All actually right. start, the, actually something comes in your mind, actually I'm giving a lecture, something comes to your mind. You can actually go to that topic and actually you can type in your question there because sometimes you might forget it later on. Okay. Or you may not get a chance to ask that question because feeling a bit hesitant about it. Okay. So you can actually put it anytime. Yeah. It is, it is a kind of innovation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I just want Shiv, uh, yeah. continuing with Nevin's query, yeah. if you got time. Yeah. Uh, essentially, I think we know there are some uh, predictors of uh, chronic pain after uh, uh, and surgery. There are uh, patient factors, there are surgical factors and environment factors which are involved. But yet, there is no study to f identify the, these predictors versus the drugs we use. Yeah. So what we need is NNT and NNH yeah. to help. I think that was where he was coming to. And it's a thin line between polypharmacy and multimodal analgesia. Absolutely. I mean, um, yeah. And, uh, you know, but again, literature, there is a lot of literature on COX-2 inhibitors, yeah. but we all know where it came from, who did it. And uh, again, um, everyone, I think when you get any of these things back into your practice and think of using it, uh, think 10 times, do your own lit literature search and identify how your patient can benefit with each of these drugs. Thank you. Yeah, I think, uh, like I said, you don't actually have to go all the way. Okay, it doesn't have to be full Monty uh, with, uh, you know, pre gabapentin uh, government and all, ketamine, lignocaine, everything. Okay, some surgeries you might be actually seeing that they are like a lot more prone than others. There you might actually want to do three or four interventions. But in the most, like I said, you just need actually just two or three interventions, simple interventions. Uh, any other questions before I leave? Yeah, Chitra. Uh, can I have a mic for Chitra, please? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, the thing is, what you said rightly, what does certain surgeries yeah. and certain conditions and certain patients who have a lot of chronic pain, yeah. like donors we have seen. Yes. Okay, amputations. Yep. So that's what people who've had chronic pain earlier and they get remedied, it goes off. Yeah. So we had donors, we gave gabapentin yeah. preoperatively yeah. and the incidents and I followed them up because this yeah. was my interest as yeah. usual like anesthetists we don't follow up. Yeah. The chances of chronic pain decreased with gabapentin, the yeah. patients I used. Yeah. So that way we can even stratify surgeries like yes. breast surgeries who have more chances of chronic pain. Yeah. Okay, so that's what I wanted to yeah. say. So I mean that is interesting needed. because donors, donors actually are very, very interesting. They are precious patients. Yeah, they and didn't. They didn't need a surgery. We gave them a surgery, and we exactly. gave them chronic pain as well. Yeah. Okay. We need to look at them much more closely. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Chitra, for the comment. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sivkumar Singh.